everything, I'm going to bring Dennis on. Um, Dennis McKenna is an ethnopharmacologist with a focus on the study of hallucinogenic plants. He is the founding board, uh, founding board principal board founder of the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Excuse me, um, getting used to this whole online format. He's also a founding board member of Hefter Research Institute, and he organized the ESPD 50 um, conference in 2017. Uh, the work he has been uh, doing is foundational to the scientific exploration of ayahuasca as well as many other realms. Um, so Dennis, I'm gonna bring you on now. Um, thank you so much. Okay. All right. Hi, hi Genevieve. Can, they, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, morning, everybody. Um, I see we have about 2,100 people watching. I don't know how many of you were at the event last night. Uh, hopefully most of you were. So congratulations. You're, you're real troopers. You, you have a tolerance for this stuff and uh, it's our job to to deliver. So we were delighted with the way it went last night. And now we're going to move into our regular Saturday programs. And uh, so we'll get started. This Today we are really blessed to have two of my closest friends, one of, one of whom I've known since 1981, Dr. Luis Eduardo Luna, who will come on a bit later, and Bruce Damer. You see the man uh to my left there and looking typically shamanic or christ-like perhaps i guarantee you he's not christ <laughs> uh but i i'm just i'm just gonna read uh, his bio sketch just to introduce you some of you may not know who bruce damer is damer sorry but he's many things he's a renaissance man and has had his fingers in many different pies over the years. He's a chronicler of psychedelic history and holds and curates the extant archives of Dr. Timothy Leary, Terence McKenna, and others. He is also a maven of the history of computing. He has a Digibar Digibarn computer museum at his place in Santa Cruz in Boulder Creek, and he is an instigator of the old multi- user virtual worlds medium. His current work is as a scientist co-authoring and testing a new hypothesis for the origin of life and guiding NASA where life might arise in the universe. This is the part of his work that just is utterly fascinating to me. He has just spent two decades designing spacecraft and missions for NASA and other space agencies with the objective of opening the solar system to the expansion of life off the Earth. Recently, he's put on a philosopher and public thinker's head, I think he means cap, <laughs> exploring and considering the questions, how did this all come to be and where is it all going? So these are like, these are the big questions, right? <laughs> these are the over overarching questions. And lately, he has begun a practice in the healing arts, learning how the human operating system is written and tools and boots up into our personality and response to the world. Knowing and optimizing the human operating systems is perhaps the most important technology of this century and beyond. Bruce, welcome. Great to see you. So, so why, don't, why don't you tell us, Bruce, how you met Terence and, and got involved with his, his, his life and his stuff. I remember you didn't really come on my radar until I think uh, the last uh, maybe a couple of years before Terence died, 98, 99. I know you were doing things with him. So why don't we pick up the thread there? Yeah, so so Terrence and I were introduced in 97. Okay. And uh, uh, we had numerous conversations and emails, and we, we kind of then decided to somehow merge efforts. He was interested in cyberspace. You know, he had, you know, read enough Omni magazine articles and things like that that, and he felt that cyberspace was a powerful medium, not only for 
knowledge and, and human interaction, but some kind of mycelial network. And he was talking about it a lot. And so what I, what I did was we, we tried to arrange for him to come to our avatars conference and that didn't work out. So what he, what he did was he came to the house here to ancient Oaks farm with Ralph, Abraham and Finn, I think on the day of Finn's 20th birthday. And I sat him down in front of a big screen right in the room over here and introduced him to a new kind of cyberspace, virtual worlds with avatars, people embodied visually. And they were not they were actually the, the no body people that, that Terrence used to say was under your bed. Uh, anyway, so, and he, he was kind of gobsmacked about it. And enough that we decided to do the all chemical virtual powwow experiment, sort of a, uh, another experiment like the experiment at La Chirera, but really it was, it was a practical experiment for him to see whether cyberspace could convey the psychedelic experience. Late nineties, low res, 3D, 3D worlds. Could it, could it really communicate uh, that feeling uh, the sense of cyberspace. So we we did it. We went to his house in 1999 and we did the alchemical virtual powwow in active worlds and the viewers can find it. Uh, it's 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 a video on YouTube called Terrence McKenna on the Natch on the Natch <laughs> at home being an avatar with Finn and me and Christy and it's a tremendous little piece uh, from his house in Hawaii. And it, it worked to the extent that uh, I asked Terrence, how did this compare? How did this DMT inflected world and this hyperboreal gate that everyone went through to enter it, how did it compare uh, with DMT? And he, he, he replied in a perfect Terrenceism, it's not, Unlike DMT. Now, now you're muted. Oh, wait a minute. Am I muted? Now you're back. Okay. So he said it was not unlike DMT, but in in fact, it it it's different than DMT. Did he have any? Uh, did he have anything to say about that? Does he, did he think that this this system could supplant psychedelics? Well, that that was his fascination. Mm -hmm. That was his fascination, and you know, we were we were tunneled in over that satellite dish from his house, and uh, and we were we were in a virtual world. We were we were also in a a. Uh, I'd say an altered state. So they are related. They mm -hmm. really are related. Uh, and we talked late into the night about that and novelty and machine intelligence and the eschaton and singularities. Right, right. I'm getting so a lot of things coming through on the text thread that shows that people are still having audios um audio problems can can you can everyone in the audience hear me um dennis i we can definitely hear you um bruce i'm wondering if you may have another tab with this same window open we're hearing a slight echo just wondering if you might be able to check your browser no, no there's no other tabs Okay. Well, again, thank you everybody for being patient with the echo. Um, we can hear you, and and the content is really amazing. Thank you both for speaking. Yeah. Now, now I'm I'm getting feedback that we're the you know that the audio is working. So this is humbling, you know. I mean, that like we said last night, the tech is great when it works, and it but it always turns on you, you know, at the most critical moment. So. Uh, 
Well, so so that's what you guys worked on, and and where did that go? Did it did it did you eventually do events, or did uh, I mean that was right in the critical period when Terrence yeah. was ill, so he probably had bigger fish to fry in some ways than you know to try and do uh, a, another big virtual event. Were, were were you at the Alchemical Arts Conference mm -hmm. that, he, that he staged? You were there. Yeah. yeah. So that was, yeah, I, I did not go, but but how was that? That was a that was a an actual physical conference on the Big Island. Yeah. So what what happened for the listeners is, well, Jim and I were at Terence's house, and one of the things that Jim said about Terence was. Oh my God, he doesn't look good. He's he's ashen faced. Mm -hmm. He's not looking well compared mm -hmm. to a year ago. And uh, Terrence actually commented to us that uh, I'm having dreams I can't explain. They're so weird. They're so strange. And we thought, wow, you know, if, if Terrence is having dreams that are disturbing to him then something is going on and it was perhaps the early indication of the of the tumor that was about to erupt so about two months after we were there he had the seizure and yep. christy took him to come off the mountain and the whole cycle began and ken symington and uh, his his team had already planned a conference for Kona called Alchemical Arts, which was in sort of alternate to uh, time to Palenque. And we were all invited and we realized this could be the goodbye for Terrence, this could, for us to say goodbye. And so ev everyone came and Alex and Allison, uh, you know, Robert Venosa and Martina, um, uh, the uh, is it uh, Tom Robbins, the writer? It was a tremendous group. Constance Demby shipped her space base by by ocean, and it was a tremendous meeting. And at one point, Terence commented, um, we, "We this is toward the end, and we were kind of saying our goodbyes." And Terence suddenly blurted out. Uh, posthumous glory that's where the action is so here we are <laughs> yes yeah yes indeed i mean it's it's interesting that terence uh you know youtube didn't exist w when he passed on and and yet you know when it did come on he's kind of achieved a, a second well, I wouldn't call it life, but there's certainly certainly an active presence on the internet thanks to YouTube and other sources. But that's probably the main one, and and I guess in part it's a testimony to how much material there is. You know, I mean Lorenzo Haggerty. I don't know if he's on today, but he mentioned last night he has an enormous archive mm -hmm. of yeah. Terence's material from doing psychedelic salon for so many years and i believe you can access most of that so terence is very much part of the cultural conversation still the difference is that a lot has happened since he more or less left the stage and i wonder so what we're getting from terence is sort of like this oracular voice out of cyberspace is his take on the global planetary situation which he's been talking about since the early 90s and i i think it's a testament to either you know to how prescient he is that that so many have what he says the the talks that you can access on the internet are so very timely you know they could have been made yesterday or maybe not yesterday but recently it's as though he anticipated all these changes and yet, you know, when he died, we were at the end of the millennium and the end of the 20th century. You know, he didn't quite make it to the 21st century. Mm -hmm. But so much of what he talked about and anticipated was about the future, about what was going to happen. 
what do you think his perspective would be now, Bruce, especially that the 20th, 21st century is turning out to be pretty grim in a lot of ways? But I also, think, uh, as always, promising, you know? I mean, it's always a two-edged sword. But what, what, what are your thoughts on all that? Well, in, in some ways, I, I don't really agree that it's turned out to be grim. I mm. think that there's so much that is good going on, uh, but it's, it's, it's overshadowed by the grim narrative, which is yes. a really dangerous thing. Right. Uh, t t but Terrence... Terence would have identified something very, very clearly about this day that I think that we are getting a strong look at with the COVID-19. Terence used to say, why are we led by the least among us? And being the least competent, the least conscious, the least present, the least heart empathic or caring, the least mm -hmm. mentally capable, why mm -hmm. are we led by these people? And it, this is what it really has led to. You know, in this country, we have a rocketing infection rates from COVID, gutted, a, a gutted social health system and unemployment system that was gutted over 30 years by the insanity of ideologues and and in a sense, banksters and corporate and large investors who gutted, they gutted our social welfare net. And so yep. now 30% of the people are gonna fall through it. And, you know, it's just, it's absurd that we spent $3 trillion on absolutely pointless and destructive wars with no one saying a peep. Right. And we, we are now indebted, you know, it, and it was all completely clear that we were being led by the least among us. And, you know, people, um, not, unlike the 60s and 70s, uh, there aren't the mass protests. There aren't the pushes. People are very anesthetized. And perhaps this is the wake up call that we need strong leadership in this century. We need to replace that entire set of people and electoral methodologies and money buying le legislation. And I think Terrence would have, would have really come out strongly uh, as his audience had grown, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, the points you raise are very good. And, but it's, it seems like, yeah, clearly we need this reform. We need this reform of government our institutions, our, our medical infrastructure, everything. And yet as a species, we don't plan for these disasters. You know, we know that these things are going to happen. We're having the biggest pandemic since 20, since 1918 mm. now, and we know there are others in the future. We could have seen this coming, you know, I mean, Theoretically, we knew it was coming. We couldn't say what the date was, but we knew, I mean, years ago, we knew there was going to be this. So why is this happening, Bruce? Why, why is the body politic unable, you know, to elect competent leaders? You know, I mean, why is it so dysfunctional that government is actually an obstacle to, to you know, solving some of these problems you, you you can't just get rid of government because that's the only thing that's holding anything together i mean what we're in a fine mess you know and well, I, I think all of these things are coming together in such a way that you know the the covid virus as we said last night is is you know as about as benign a pandemic as it could be in terms of its overall impact and yet it's shutting down global commerce. It's shutting down, you know, what holds the world together, transportation, supply chains, all of this. Is this a message from the uh, from mm -hmm. Gaia saying, basically, look how easy it is to completely disable all your systems, you know? And yeah, this is very humbling. What do we do about it? I mean, it 
Go I've ahead. Been, I've been doing a, a practice uh, that I call realming. And I started this when I was a little kid, uh, where my consciousness goes through space and time. So one of the things it did was go into the solar system to figure out how to gain access to that in this century. Another thing is it went back to the origin of life to try to figure out how we emerged. But it, it smears out through, through time. And so uh, starting about 30 years ago, I started to see these waves in the 2020s and 2030s, this kind of crazy dynamic. And the reason I bought this property here, this farm here, was to prepare for uh, those, those crazy waves and to establish a solid base. I stopped listening to news media. So I don't, I don't mainline all that cultural anxious content because I needed to be super clear to be able to, to see and not carried by the waves, but watching the storm from you know the prow of the ship or whatever. And as a result, I think that I can get downloads on this, this thing. And about two years ago, I thought pandemics are coming and they're going to be like the Spanish flu. And we even spun a company out from campus to create a small interfering RNA to prepare to create a universal blocker for viral pandemics. And that's ongoing. And I'm talking to investors to try to get that accelerated. But the second thing that happened when COVID was, was breaking out, I saw an image. Now think of your hair like here. I saw a comb going through hair over and over again. And I realized this was, this was Gaia or the homeostatic system of the planet uh, doing its natural thing to come back to health and homeostasis to start to call out the impact of a overpopulated species. And when I was a kid in Canada, this happened to our local deer population when there were no wolves in the area and we cut all the trees down and there was all this foraging and the deer mm -hmm. population just exploded. So uh, there was a disease that came through, a virus that came through and there was massive die off and I watched this as a kid. They reintroduced the wolves and they asked hunters to hunt more deer to try to establish this homeostasis again. And I think that this is what's happening. And what it I think that the, it almost has an intelligence to it. Because if you look at all of life as being in one mycelial grid, one intelligence. If you look at life as a single entity, it is going to move. If it has a stomach ache, it's going to move toward solving the stomach ache, which means excavation. And the whole of Gaia may be an, an internet work system. And human beings themselves may represent an internet worked superorganism at this point. And so this combing through of COVID does several things. It, it will trim our population, but it will trim our demand. It will trim our, our number of uh, trips we're taking, restaurants we're going to, stuff mm -hmm. we're orbiting online. It will focus us on being with each other, reestablishing eye to eye contact and getting out of this hyper driven, performative, too much information, to bring, bring the noise level down and mm -hmm. it's like guys take a breath and look at each other and it's a wake up so it, it i think that the covid is a master teacher and it it's going to be painful but it's it if if covid 19 will yield to covid 21 and covid 24 and all the mutations and the things that will keep coming there's going to be wave upon wave of these things, and it's going to reshape us. And, and to your point, originally, I think it's going to create a distaste 
for the kind of leadership, this sort of extremist leadership backed by fake news and basically lying, public lying, because people need facts if they're going to survive. If, if a country or a state in the U.S. fell under the ideological influence that said, well, everyone go out and party and 30% of the population dies, they're going to lose that ideology pretty fast. It's, it's Darwinian natural selection at the species level, at, mm. the, at the mimetic level and the genetic level to bring the planet and us into homeostasis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. This is, this is part of the process. You know, you, you, you talk about the virus as a, as a, you know, this is Gaia calling the herd in a certain sense, but there's not significant amounts of culling going on. I mean, we have 7 billion people or closer to seven and a half now. And as callous and cold as it sounds to say it, if 200 million people die, that's a tiny fraction mm -hmm. of the population, unfortunately. You know, and, and these, pan now the next, the next pandemic might could be much worse and will bring out you know will will take out much much higher parts of the you know portion of the population this is not an outcome that that we like to think about because we are the species that's being called but uh, you know i mean gaia is not sentimental you know gaia is oriented towards survival and main, maintenance of the of the homeostasis and we're we're pushing all those envelopes to the nth degree and that's why our societal and economic systems and infrastructure and so on is is under such pressure and, and i guess my question is is there a way i mean will things ever go back to normal or is there a way that we can come to the new the new situation and minimize death, minimize the number of deaths and get through this transition. And, and then, and, you know, a, a, an aspect of, of that, what you're talking about is, will this wise us up? Will this start, will this make us realize we have to prepare for COVID 2021, COVID 2024? It looks like this is the future for now will we rise to the occasion or will it be like global warming or, or climate change? You know, when 30 years ago, we, we knew that climate change was coming. We knew that if we began to do things at that point to get ready for it, we could slow it down. Well, nobody did anything. So mm -hmm. now we're in like a major crisis around climate change on top of the pandemic. Climate change doesn't end just because you're having a pandemic. It only gets worse. So what do you do, Bruce? I mean, you and I are supposed to be people that are that are broadcasting a positive message here. But sometimes I think it's very hard to do that and not not deliberately being deceptive. I mean, truth is hard. You know, the truth is a, a hard thing to listen to sometimes. And so I, here, here's, an, here's an approach. The, uh, well, to address your first question, I think that we will go back to some semblance of normal and then the metabolic uh, body of humans will start to expect to come back to where it was, right? And it will charge up but with less less veracity. You know, the air travel will come up about 30% and the people will sort of come back into it. And then if we're hit again, if there's an er eruption again, as there was in 1919 with the Spanish flu, it kept erupting all over the world. Mm -hmm. My grandmother's family, a lot of them died in, in Ladner, BC by a 1919 eruption. Yeah. And so, then it will shape us again. It's like, oh, you thought you thought it was safe to go back in the water, but it isn't. And then the evolutionary uh, shaping can start. 
So if the if viral pandemics are the chosen method to tame this wild uh, beast of human desire and consumption, it's going to do it in a kind of staged way again and again and again and slow the metabolic rate, the con rate of consumption. Because, you know, uh, if you go back to 1980, I think I saw a statistic that in the United States, there was only about 50% of the built up retail and restaurants that you have in 2020. But the population is only about 25% more or so. So mm -hmm. all of this was built and people feel they need it. I mean, they go and they, they buy more expensive houses, they buy all this stuff and they get into deeper debt. But back when I was a kid in the 60s, we didn't go to restaurants at all. I mean, my mother made everything at home. Mm -hmm. So our, our impact was low. So what if we did lose 50% of the retail? 50%. And what if we lost 70% of the stuff that is being shipped from China that we don't really need? It ends up in landfills. That would be a major follow-on effect for sustainability. And so perhaps this is the most intelligent, gentlest way to step us off that ledge, you know, because if there's less demand in, in the economy, there's less reason to burn more of the Amazon and raise more cattle for more hamburgers, for more fast food or whatever you name it. Lower right. the metabolic rate and you lower the, the, the gas emissions into the atmosphere as we're seeing. Yes, but it will take a long time to turn that around, you know, the, the gas emissions, but you, you probably will slow it down somewhat, you know, and the, the, the future that you, that you anticipate, which is less consumer oriented, less economic activities, people are not buying huge houses or, or all this mindless consumerism and waste that, that contributes to you know, has contributed to the problem. But then on the on the sort of human resources side, how do you deal with all the people who are losing their livelihood, mm -hmm. who, who depend on this consumer retail, uh, you know, economy? I mean, what are they going to do? How are we going to take care of the people most at risk? I think in part, well, certainly it requires a, you know, it requires a change in perspective. It requires we reintroduce, in, in, you know, the notion of compassion into society. Mm -hmm. We're we're a society that has a serious compassion deficit. Yeah. You know, and that is certainly supported by our leaders who are apparently un, uh, incapable of compassion. So you get this mindset that, well, for example you know, uh, reactivating economic activity is more important than saving lives. So you choose profit, you know, you basically make a conscious decision to, uh, you know, it, to in, in favor of genocide. I mean, let's, let's call it for what yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. It's better to lose millions, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of lives than to let the economy go down. This is not, I mean, so this, this is I a have, very twisted attitude. It's not an I, ethical attitude. I have a suggestion that it may not matter what leadership does, that this thing is underway. So in the what's happening here on the farm, here in Ancient Oaks Farm, people assembled when this thing started. We're, we just planted a large vegetable garden out there, just literally the seeds went in because it just started raining. And what you're going to see, as you've seen the trend in the Bay Area and also the, the millennial generation, they can't afford all the consumerism. They don't have job security. So they live communally. And, and here at, at Wildflower, at the farm here, we're building a community. We're going to have half a dozen or eight or nine people living here. No, no single family homes. I mean, those are disappearing. Those are going on the way out. We're living collectively. Mm -hmm. When you live collectively and you 
you buy healthier foods collectively, you grow your food, you share in finance, everything, you can, you're much healthier and you're much more sustainable. So if someone's out of a job, others can help. Others are making dinners for them. Uh, it's a new way to live. And yet it was the old way we lived back in the 1930s. And we lived in communal houses. We lived in villages. And that produced robust, sustainable, and healthy lifestyles. And this whole separation into the consumer in their box, working for the corporation in a box, to, mm -hmm. to do something virtual called your retirement planning, such that you go to heaven, you know, when the Temple of Eleusis was destroyed, this is the system that was introduced by the apostolic church, right? Pay right. your tithes, and then you get the access to the kingdom of heaven. That's perhaps a myth and, and a, a lifestyle that's going to go away because the millennial and iGen generations, they're not going to have, and they're not going to be investing in the stock market and mutual funds and all this, this kind of nonsense because that may be also deflated so that institutional investors have lost half their wealth and they've lost it permanently. So mm -hmm. their political power is, is shaky. And you see a new society rising, communal living, group living, using the tools invented right here in the Bay Area, all this fantastic social networking, using the sharing economy and, and building a new society from the bottom up. And it just pushes the old one off. And, and, and it's already underway. This is underway here and many places. And I think that the, the comments are, are raising that issue. Uh, and that political power comes from those who can create wealth. And I was on a cruise about five years ago called Summit at Sea, where there was at least $300 billion in private wealth. Uh, the founders of Uber and Google and all were there. And, and I realized when standing on the deck of this huge ship, we were watching Edward Snowden on a jumbotron and everyone in that audience agreed and supported what Edward was saying. And I realized this is the new power. This is the new political power rising out of the roots of Silicon Valley and creative communities. And you see the, the old power, the people who decided Snowden was bad rather than that creating, he was creating transparency and trying to liberate us those people are threatened by this new rising power uh, that, that is coming from wealth creators who created cyberspace and for reinventing transportation, that energy, everything. And it's just really a matter of time before the, the new rising uh, wealth plus the new way of living. And they talk about hipsters, hippies, and, and uh, hackers, right? Those mm -hmm. are the, I've been described as both a, a hippie and a hacker and a little bit of a hipster. Catherine here is my beloved. She's trying to make me more hip, you know. Uh, but the HHH, the three H people are freaking taking over. And so I see that as a, as a huge positive thing. And we are on this Crowdcast platform because of hackers hippies and hipsters who, who created a new medium that the entire world now depends upon. Guess, who's, guess who has controlling the levers behind the curtain right now? And I think if we acknowledge that and, and don't pay much heed to the, the old guard because they're not serving us, we say we have the power and psychedelics coming into the culture now is a powerful tool of from hippies to hackers that help make all this. And it's it's a hipster tool too. This is our medicine. This is our elixir. This mm -hmm. is going to transform the freaking world. You know, it started with marijuana. And this is sort of bring the conversation back to the subject Terrence loves so much, but it's it's all coming to pass.
Yeah, it's coming to pass, but it's it's it's. So what do you do? Yeah, I mean, the, the, this is we've always anticipated this. We always thought psychedelics will be the catalyst that wakes up the world. And and what we have to get out from under is 2000 years of devaluation of nature. You know, what has been shoved down our throat in the guise of the Abrahamic religions, which is basically a, a an excuse to devalue nature, to approach it as a commodity, something that we exploit. Nature is bitch slapping us right now and saying, hey, wait a minute, you're forgetting who's boss here. Nature is the boss, and it's demonstrating that very, you know, very clearly, and certainly not as brutally as it might, you know, but that's a necessary wake up call. I hope you're right that as we develop these new social paradigms, these new uh, frameworks for living together, I guess you could call it living communally, consuming less everyone supports everyone the idea that if you don't have a job if you don't go to the work every morning and work in a cubicle that you're somehow not a worthy human being you know many people don't have that kind of jobs but many people that you know when you have a more holistic community there's a role for everyone and and there's a more uh, you know room for compassion and because everyone is you know faced with the same challenges and, and and so you know we we can have empathy i don't know why you know i mean i mean i think a lot of our problem is that there is not enough enough empathy in the world and it's almost as though to be empathetic with someone is is denounced you know and and, and this is maybe this is more the american mindset than other places like everyone for themselves you know we've always had this preoccupation with individualism in in the states and mm -hmm. you know and uh, that's, other that's countries really uh, that's really shifting now because you know i'm in touch with all the silicon valley ventures i i i do healing work i'm in a i'm in an energy healing and awakening school that has two very wealthy um venture capital people they're in the healing school with us they're experienced they're really awake they're really present and they're pulling the the, the levers of power because they decide on what billions of dollars go into new ventures and so as those people become more heart-centered i've watched this over five years one of one of our my dear friends in this uh, luminous awareness uh, school that I've been in for four or five years, he has transformed. This is what when you we talked about in the introduction, the human OS. So beyond mm -hmm. psychedelics, beyond technical solutions, beyond ideologies, how humans roll and will roll in the future comes from how they are feeling down here, how the experiences they had as babies, as five-year-olds, as 10-year-olds, as 15-year-olds shaped them and their lineage, their cultural lineage, familial lineage going back. And what we have learned to do in this time is to unravel the OS of humans. Eckhart Tolle, uh, gave us the first glimpse in the early 90s when he talked about the pain body, which was he would trigger his, pa his patients into a kind of emotional eruption or a closing down or a verbal tirade because he touched some painful part in them that then took over their system and ran them. And he would record the clients and play the recordings back and the clients had gone what on what he called unconscious and they couldn't believe that that they were taken over it's like jekyll and hyde and so that that set off a whole inquiry that has merged neuroscience uh pharmacopoeia uh the energy and healing arts the energy healing for real 
which involves attunement and tracking, not, not fantasy, not ideation in the new age. This stuff is working. I'm, I'm, I'm literally, day to day, I watch it. And I watch my own little inner kindergarten, my little wounded parts running around. And when I see Donald Trump, I see his wounded little boy in there in multiple parts. And that he, he reacts based upon the touching of those painful parts that were created by his father uh, as he was, he was a little kid. And so I have, I have compassion for the man because he suffers. He's, he's dissociated all the time. He's acting out. He's, it, it's kind of, it's crazy. But I have compassion because Donald Trump has the chance in his lifetime of release from, from that torment, from those cycling voices, from that me, me, me thing, and from, from those triggers. He has a chance, just like everyone in the world has a chance as release from, from that wheel of samsara, if you will. And we're, we're, we're nailing this. We're figuring how humans boot up. And plant medicines are a, a really important tool and so is Vipassana, and so is breath work, and so is Wim Hof, and so is extreme sports, and so is better diet, because our gut biome drives our psychology so much, and we're learning that the gut biome is attached to disease and how you feel and how you, how you react emotionally. It's incredible. So as we enter the 2020s, we have all the tools we need to help create generation upon generation of healthier and healthier and saner and more compassionate human beings. We can do this thing. We can do it if, if we as techies, hackers, hippies, and hipsters say, this is our project. It is the healed human. It is the high functioning, beautiful, uh, whimsical, uh, a human who's not triggered all the time, who's not triggered by the culture, it's not triggered by fake news. They're, they are wise, but they're super present and they're fun to be around and they're really brilliant at leadership and at science and everything. We can do this if we own it as a project. And this is, this is the work I'm taking on in the world is that we can we can create that that beautiful world we that our hearts know is is possible and to quote charles eisenstein we can do it we have all the tools and we have smartphones and we we have this and we're we've never been better prepared but we just have to take ownership this is our project i think i mean this this is this is a great vision. I mean, this is a very hopeful narrative that you're presenting here. You know, I have two questions, though, or two, what you might call lingering doubts or wondering. One, one of them is the scenario that you describe is going to take decades, possibly generations to, to really come into flower, right? the path toward planetary disaster and total collapse of all the systems is, is, is it's on a fast track. It's accelerating. So my first question is, do we have time enough to evolve into this or will, will events overtake us? And despite the best of intentions, you know, uh, will we un be unable to do it? This is my concern about, about plant medicines too, you know, apart from, how we're going to make those sustainable and so on. Those problems can be adjust, addressed, but can you get enough people to mm -hmm. plant medicines in mm -hmm. time to get enough people to wake up to make a difference? So that's one question. The other that's thing is mm -hmm. the entrenched power structures, the power hegemony right now that's working under the old model, they're not just going to quietly... Uh, you know, say, okay, we screwed it up. Now you guys can take it over and fix it. And they will not go quietly or peacefully. How do we deal with those two things, the acceleration and the reluctance of the entrenched power structures to yield the floor, as it were? So the, 
the I think that the if I realm forward into say the 2060s and 2070s when I'll be a hundred and you'll be like 300 years old. <laughs> well, not quite, but I, I don't really expect to be around unless there's some ma major breakthroughs and, and that, you know, that may be a good thing. I mean, this may be a situation where the term Grateful Dead uh, really has <laughs> meaning, you know. Terrence's <laughs> favorite band, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, what I'm seeing in the 60s and 70s, because pretty much the projects that I, I undertook, like how did we begin as a life on this earth? And therefore, how does evolution work? That was a 90 year project I took on when I was 14. And then this, when I was 16, I took on the project of how do we expand Gaia herself into the solar system and extend life and build more worlds for her, duplicate the, the cell, the super cell of earth and make new ones. And the technical solutions I, presented in 2015 in two TEDx talks. Yes. The listeners can see on damer.com. And those are underway. And I'm counting on those two things to help lift human beings into a new sense of hope. To, that we, in the origin of life, that what we may have shown is that human beings and all of life did not start as competing individuals duking it out, the first simple protocells four billion years ago. It started as a communal complex of simple protocells in collaboration. And we may be able to show this in the 2020s. And it's as powerful a cultural idea as Albert Einstein's proof of general relativity in 1919 that created this, this revolution of modernism in the, in the 1920s. This powerful idea that we emerged from a common community, not from uh, com competing ancestors. And we can show this chemically in the lab. So that's that one. The, the, to your original question, I think there's a bigger plan for us and that there's some script writer somewhere who said, this is the ultimate Hollywood thriller human beings and their relationship with their world as they grow up and shape up and stand up and, and get wise. It's a Hollywood thriller and it, there's going to be a car chase at the end. It's, it's always going to come down to that, that stressful, dramatic thing that is all the way evolution always works. So if you, if you look at a gazelle being chased by a cheetah, for example, it's dramatic. There's initially the, the gazelle makes some progress and then there's a moment of decision. The gazelle slips or the cheetah pauses somehow and either the gazelle is ca captured or the cheetah has, runs out of energy and it's always that knife edge. And that's what I think we're headed toward. We're headed toward well, we, we stack up all the things that can help us survive that, that cheetah chase and, and all the things that we're facing and we have awareness, burning rainforests, consumption, crazy weather patterns, pandemics. And then we have all these tools here and we write a script that says, we're going to, when the stress gets intense, we're gonna punch through because we have all the tools and we have aware, awareness, Hollywood thriller ending. And, and we have several more decades. I mean, I, I think we have the entire run rate of this, this century, because I don't see the signs of, of, of really severe climate change uh, yet. The second to the second question is the power structures. Well, um, what I've been doing in the last uh, year or so is working with an admiral from the Pentagon uh, who I met in Qatar in the Middle East about a year and a quarter ago. And what we cooked up was something called Climate Mitigation Associates, a huge global effort involving trillions of dollars of finance to transform, uh, to protect infrastructure. That's what attracts companies and cities, but to transform economics. 
And every time we we put the CMA vision, which we call climate moonshots, every time we've put it out there, I put it to uh, bankers, I've put it to generals and admirals, I've put it to government, I've I've put this vision out to Silicon Valley VC, and our whole group has. There's a huge uptake on this. Like, how do we sign on for climate moonshots and the CMA? How do we? And it's across the board. So if we create an other, if we create separation and say there is a mysterious power structure out there that will not, they have these secret meetings and they have their own their own Zoom sessions now and they're trying to do their own thing. I don't think that exists. I think it's individuals and their little stovepipes trying to get their kids through college and trying to do their best. And if we create this ogre, if we create the bogeyman that there is such a power structure and it, it's all so intelligence, I think we're deluding ourselves. Because you know, for the last 20 years, I've moved in and out of all those communities and I find human beings. That's what I find mm -hmm. there is human beings. And so engagement, yeah. engagement in the, in the common vision, if we have to spend 15 trillion, We've got 15 trillion. It's all locked up in these ridiculous funds that are underperforming. So you can change your language and talk to a finance person. You can change your language again and, and, and talk to somebody who's heading a corporation. Change your language again and talk to the hippie hipster, you know, techie. And and they'll all just say, yeah, we we want this this beautiful experiment in, in the human the human experiment at, uh, at Earth, at Terra, to continue, and we're we're listening. So they're looking for leadership too. They're looking for clear, compassionate, uh, and logical, not made up stuff like real engineering solutions is what they're looking for. Well, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I am not sure that. Uh, you know, uh, ag again, I, I think this is a beautiful vision and I hope this is where it's evolving. I'm not sure that uh, radical climate change is, is that far away. You know, it depends on what the, uh, who you believe, what the projections are. I mean, maybe we have till 2050, maybe we have till 2100, I, I don't know, but it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. And as far as the political changes, I guess we're experiencing that right now. I mean, we're, we're in a place now where, at least in the States, the because of the virus and and all that that's affected, the electoral system is apparently completely dysfunctional. It will be very interesting to see how it turns out. I'm afraid it may turn out not in a way that most of us would would want to see it, you know, because this is an opportunity for essentially the authoritarian to, to retreat into authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. You know, this seems to be a trend in many parts of the world. And in yeah, some yeah. ways, you can see if government is going to, you know, solve some of these problems, they have to have centralized power to do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe, assuming that they have some element of compassion. But how do you see us avoiding that and getting, avoiding retreated into authoritarianism or, or authoritarianism because the global becomes the global governing standard and this more holistic, more symbiotic type of society mm -hmm. uh, is just suppressed. I mean, it's just, it's just not seen as it's, it's not allowed to flourish because the power is concentrated elsewhere and, so, uh... and has no respect for human life at all. I think that what we have to also realize is the authoritarianism of the 1930s, for example, uh, where uh, there really was an effective secret police system in many countries uh, leading up to World War II. Uh, I lived in Czechoslovakia starting in 1990, 
just as the Berlin Wall had fallen, I went to Eastern Europe, I went to Yugoslavia during the war in Yugoslavia. And I saw what authoritarianism looked like from its immediate af aftermath. And we are nowhere near that system. In fact, we don't have a reference for that, for that type of authoritarian system. And the people that, that I knew, I employed people who had been through the, what was called Absurdistan after the Prague Spring. Uh, and they said, basically, you can't do this. You couldn't do this again because everybody carries in their, their hand a supercomputer that is a window on the world. Yeah. Authoritarianism needs absolute control of information. In the Soviet Union, typewriters were illegal, for example, for, pub, for the public or copiers of any kind. The, the cat is out of the bag on that one. We are interconnected. And so what you see in the world today is would-be authoritarian figures have a very limited range of power, very limited ability to move. In fact, Dennis, you uh, you might recall uh, in our fireside chat at Wilkatika that I had had that experience with the Lakuma tree one night. It was a it was a beautiful download vision of of a dance with her, mm -hmm. um, and I think I might have shared it the next day that I ex I showed her what psychopathy was in the human soul, like what is the psychopathic response? And I danced out to the end of one of uh, the shadows of the limbs. And I said, and it's getting less intense. The psychopaths, their teeth are kind of a little bit worn down compared to uh, Putin in Russia or Trump in America, uh, compared to predecessors like Stalin, Yeah, what they yeah. were able to do. so. Their power is being, is being contained by this massive network of, 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 of a sharing network, which in the origin of life field, we call the progenote. The progenote is the network system we think led to the booting up of the living world four billion years ago. And the progenote is coming into its dominance. It's saying everything's internetwork now and it's moving toward health. So. If there's local issues, those are dissolved and moved as this thing as this thing rolls. And you can sort of in 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 a way, anyone in this room could take one of the elixirs and go into a state. And I know you've done this, Dennis, because the plant showed you one night how uh, photosynthesis worked and how food was made. We, mm -hmm. we could all, all use the doorway available to us to talk to Lakuma trees, to talk to Gaia herself, the whole thing, and to show Gaia where, where this thing is now, ask for intelligent guidance, and also ask for help from Gaia, clues, little clues. Paul Stamets, for example, one of the clues uh, he'll be on this in a week from today, learning one day that, that if bees ate uh, these mycelial secretions, it helped them deal with colony, colony collapse disorder. Mm -hmm. You know, that was an important clue. And, and perhaps we can reverse the collapse of the bee population. And it's, it's his intimate connection with that fungal, fungal, uh, intelligence of, of Gaia, a lifetime of work that led to this clue that Gaia is helping us deal with this, with this stress on bee populations. So it's listening. And, and in a way, to go back to Terence is to say, uh, is, to, uh, is to open oneself, even beyond what, what, what Terence would say, to open our hearts and our minds to the totality of what is, of Gaia, of the complexity of human beings, of the human heart, of the human trauma, help us forward. 
and I call this the field, this huge interconnected intelligence that arranges all the synchronicities that seem to govern our lives. I talk to this field all the time and I say, hey buddy, can you help us out? Can you help guide us, send us more synchrony, shape probability, get us through. We're not alone. We are not alone. This field is working for us. We can we can reach out to and ask it to help and guide us. Well, this is uh, this is inspiring. So we are extent. Gaia is does have compassion by this by this perspective and is actually trying to help us along its most problematic species. I mean, Gaia must wonder, geez, I really screwed up when I came up with these monkeys, but maybe something good could come out of it. I see Genevieve is there. I guess that's a sign that we're just about ready to do some questions. Is that right? Yes, it is about that time. And thank you, Bruce, so much. Dennis, thank you as well. This has been an amazing conversation. And thank you for bringing it so pertinent to these current issues that we're facing right now. Um, so moving into the Q&A, we'll be here for about 30 minutes. And then we'll have uh, the breakout sessions and a short break before Luis Eduardo Luna comes on. Um, so I'm going to pull up some questions here. Um, Let's see, the first one I'm gonna bring up um, is a question for you, Dennis. It says, Dennis, I was curious of your thoughts regarding the lemon technique of taking mushrooms. There seems to be debate over whether citric acid is capable of dephosphorylating 4-PPO-DMT into 4-HO-DMT, yet consensus on the subjective effect seems to be that it speeds up onset by an hour and potency is also about three, two to three times the standard form of ingestion. Possibly the process of grinding and immersing the fruiting body of the mushroom helps to release some actives bound in the chitlin and protein. Oh gosh, it's, uh, it's above my pay grade. I mean, they're, they're basically <laughs> saying that um, ex extracting the mushrooms with a bit of citric acid will dephosphorylate the the psilocybin well that that readily happens anyway um i mean that's just you know cells are equipped with the enzymes to uh move phosphoryl groups on and off molecules that's universal i am not sure what the person's uh you know uh what what the person is is asking here uh, there are ways to uh, increase the potency of, of psilocybin, of mushrooms. Sometimes people add Syrian rue or even Banisteriopsis uh, because those have MAO inhibitors. So they will inhibit the, the breakdown of psilocybin and at least may, may increase the, the intensity, but also increase the, the time frame. Um, I personally think that maybe, uh, I mean, psilocybin is practically the perfect drug, the perfect psychedelic. Terence used to say it was made for man. I don't think he meant to exclude women. I think he meant it was made for humans. And in some ways it is. I mean, it's, it's short acting, it's non-toxic. The effects are usually quite you know, quite compatible there in most of the time, not always, but most of the time the experiences are not threatening. It fits very well into a clinical uh, paradigm as well as a shamanic paradigm. So in some ways, I'm, I'm amused in a way by all of these startup psychedelic companies that are happening, especially where I live in British Columbia. They're popping up all over the place, like mushrooms, actually. And they all have an agenda. They want to improve on psilocybin. You know, let's make an analog that's even better than psilocybin. And to which I respond, how do you improve on perfection? You know, the molecule is marvelously engineered by nature to do exactly what it does. And how's that for dodging the question? Let's go on to the next one. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for that. All right, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, shifting gears a little bit, 
Dennis, what do you think Terrence would have thought or felt about social media platforms? Um, this is definitely interesting considering that his message has been spread so much farther through mediums like um, YouTube and whatnot. Bruce may be better qualified for this answer because I'm, you know, he knows much more about social media than I do. My, my sort of initial take is that Terrence probably would have been appalled by social media, you know, in a certain way, because it's so, he was, you know, for all that he was uh, enthusiastic about cyberspace and, and the potential for getting his message out on the web. And, and I think many things that, that Bruce basically opened his eyes to about the potential of, of cyberspace, but he personally was a 19th century, like me, I, and, you know, we grew up with books. Books is what is what shaped our, our intellects, our personalities. And, and to read a book is a quintessentially solitary experience. It, you're there with the book and you're having this dialogue with the book. Other outside influences are are excluded if you pay attention to the book. So I think Terence is, you know, in terms of the inclinations of his personality, I don't think he would have uh, liked social media very very much. He would have seen that as a as a threat to his personal integrity. You know, on the other hand, he probably would have recognized the the potential of it. I mean, his uh, his attitude is probably very similar to mine, which is that because in order to do what I have to do, I can't step out of social media you know i have to use it there's no other way to do it on the other hand i know that it's you know it's a can of worms it's a pit of snakes it's you know very difficult to work with it and maintain your your perspective and you're opening yourself up to uh, you know a lot of a lot of things so i don't know what do you think he would have made of social media bruce this is one of the uh -huh. things that just wasn't even imagined by anybody uh, by in 2000 when Terrence left. So what do you what do you uh, think? Sitting in his house, watching him on his Mac, on his weird satellite collect connection, he was absolutely uh, entranced. Like I, I, many of you may not know that Terrence is a hunt and peck typer. He used two <laughs> fingers. It is right. so crazy that he wrote all these books, hunt and peck, to to to. This is how he. This is this guy. I did it. But there was we had a mailing list that he was on. He was so uh, attached to it. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think he was ever on the well on forums and stuff. But the guy was, he was a natural hermit, and mm -hmm. this was comfortable for him. So seeing him upstairs in the library on virtual worlds, on chats, on lists. I think he would have swum like a fish in it. And it, it would have allowed him the freedom to stay at home and not travel as much because he was getting totally burned out on it. Yes, he, yes. When we, when we arrived in, in uh, at Captain Cook, he said, I am so tired. I am so tired, all this travel and stuff. So I don't know, I think, it, I think he would have just embraced it. He would have. He would have taken to it. He would have jumped yeah. in and, and gone with it. Now there's a, so. I mean, there's a, I, I, I it, can certainly I can certainly relate to Terence's aversion to traveling. You know, last last year, I was doing so much that I, I was telling people, I just can't keep doing this. This is killing me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've got to step away from doing all this traveling. Well, guess what? somebody somewhere heard that because you know i was given this gift we're doing all this stuff and i'm not traveling and like terence you know my i'm an introvert my inclination is toward hermitage and uh <laughs> maybe this maybe these technologies are great for hermits you know because as you say you can interact with thousands of people you don't have to step out of your your basement office or whatever it is so it's it's very interesting that way, you know, and if you don't, I, I don't know. So, so there you have it, two different I, perspectives. I did see a, 
another question about uh, AI and singularities. Is that one we can we can do, Genevieve? Yes, let me pull that question up right now. Thank you for that, Bruce, and thank you, Dennis. Yeah. Um, so the question is, singularity, artificial intelligence, and the nature of consciousness. Yeah, because I wanted to bring this up because Terrence and I had a practically an all-night conversation on this. And it started out with him saying, and there's actually recordings of this online, Terrence says to me, and you can just see his hand in the camera. He says, you're not one of those people who believes that suddenly one day, uh, te you know, technology, software, will wake up, become super intelligent and have no more use for us. Because he, he kind of sensed that I'm a hard, I'm a hardcore reductionist. I need to see evidence i'm an engineer i build a lot of, of software i know how fallible it is and he knew that i i was not in that whole thing so i spent the next hour explaining to him the difference between computing systems and natural systems and that computing systems were brittle usually single threaded mm -hmm. uh, usually extremely one-dimensional or two-dimensional and they didn't use genes. They didn't. They weren't subject to the laws of evolution. And they were. They did everything in what's known as a uh, predictable uh, method, not using what's called stochastics, where things are kind of random. And that a glass of water can, does more computation than all the Mac, the Max, like Terence's Mac, in the world. And that the medium of life is is vastly different from the medium of computing. And that I spent the next 20 years working on this, working on what is novelty. How do things compress into novelty? We, mm -hmm. we talked about that night. Worked it out. We worked out a formula by, by 2011. We found a formula called the cosmic wiggle in honor of Terence's cosmic giggle. <laughs> we worked it out. And because of that conversation that night, but what I what I brought to Terrence was Terrence, there there is no way that that there's going to be a technological singularity. No one understands consciousness. No one understands the complexity of biology. It's a sci-fi idea, and we shouldn't be worried about it. We we should we should focus on different things, which is how do these systems serve humans. In, in synergy and in marvelous synergy with human beings for our survival and our joy and our entertainment, things like this. And by about two in the morning, Terrence said, well, because he also asked me about Y2K and I said, Terrence, nothing is gonna happen in Y2K. It's a <laughs> big overblown thing and nothing's gonna happen in 2012 either. And Terrence kind of sat back and took another toke <laughs> and said, well, I hope they don't take it all too literally. You know, it was his shtick. It was his thing. It got got butts in seats and everything. And it was just kind of like, it's just, it's entertainment. And, but, I, you know, and nothing did happen at Y2K and nothing happened at 2012. And I think we yeah. got cured of that. Uh, two, two of the biggest non-events in human history. Yeah, and Y two K in twenty twelve. I mean, that's 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 interesting that these hugely anticipated events uh, turn out to be duds, essentially duds. Yeah, and the, ex it, the expectation is deflated, and and we move on. And now yeah, here we, we are, get, eight we, years later. Nobody predicted this, but this is sort of like you know, this is the paradigm changer. This is the, in some ways eschatological event that that the uh that the time wave was supposed to predict of course it didn't but that but that you know this uh, this uh, es eschatological expectation now we may be there you know and uh yeah so you you contributed quite significantly to the collapse of terence's worldview you know, I mean, it wasn't bad enough that 
mathematicians had come along and, and, you know, threw cold water on the time wave, you know, and then you came along and I, I think uh, Y2K, everyone was anticipating Y2K. He did not live to see the effect of that, but nothing happened. What, and, what I can, what I can say is that conversation that night of Terrence saying, what is novelty? How do things get together and form more complex things and not break apart? And because of that conversation, because of Terrence, in the last time that I saw him, Terrence said to me, keep telling the story, keep telling the story, but tell your own story. And I took that to heart that Terrence had asked me to carry this work on, these questions. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it resulted in, in this, in 2017, a mm -hmm. scientific revolution. This is our work on the cover of, of Scientific American. It, and I have really Terrence to, to thank because he passed in you know April 3rd, 2000. And then I said, you know, I'm going to continue to, to do this. And we did a massive computational research called the evolution grid. And then we turned it into chemistry when we realized computers couldn't help us solve the mystery of the origin of life. And we found that we found a cycle in nature, wet, dry cycling in hot spring pools. We went to those pools and introduced the reagents, reagents that are that can come from space and form protocells. And we drove it all the way to the point where we saw novelty, novelty emerging from basic chemicals cycled in a system with energy stepping up in the in the cosmic wiggle and we could see that this is how life can get started and my god i mean now we're mining this vein for more goodies you know we're, we're finding that wow life has three components it has wiggling together which is collaboration it has memory writing and reading because we're seeing the first genetic polymers possible in the system. Mm -hmm. And it has this kind of overall field effect that Rupert Sheldrake will talk about in two weeks called the uh, morphogenetic field. And he and I have talked about this now, how the origin of life is the origin of this, this field. So we're in huge pay dirt. We're, if Terrence was a, around today, he would be absolutely fascinated that that we decoded this and we're proving it in hardcore science but it has impacts in philosophy and even spiritual spiritual pursuits and and we're we are carrying forward terence's questions his burning questions and to me it's it's very gratifying uh that to have had the sh the short amount of interaction with your brother i feel so grateful to have encountered him, I miss him. We were gonna go on tour together. We were going to go to Esalen in 2000 and we were gonna, we were gonna co-present. And, but I'm, I'm, I'm faithful to his request. And also how to merge the magic state, how to merge, to merge the magic with the mundane, if you will. And how to, how to bring the, the Chalcedony jewels back from the machine elves to make them manifest in the world that's the trick right and and with the origin of life work we've done that we we've solved some of the major major questions of the origin of life in the space of magic with a directed approach and brought that and made it work in the physical world and said thank you thank you for being a being a space that we can go and, and, and do magic and make it real. And so Terrence, I think his legacy was to keep the pilot right light running for 20 years on mm. this thing and to mm -hmm. tell the tale so well that it attracted people into magic, back to magic, like me. You know, he, he enabled my, my first journey. You know, and then we could compare notes. And what a what a great hyperboreal gatekeeper he was. And 
So I just wanted to, if we're concluding, just send out a huge wave of gratitude to this man, this, despite his foibles and his faults, you know, and we all have them. But thank you. Thank you for telling the, the tale in such a joycy and silvery way of the magic to attract us all, to make a signpost, to have us all go and seek out the magic, that there is more than the mundane, that we can blend them together and make beautiful existences. Yeah, very good, very good. Wow, thank you, thank you so much, Bruce. Um, Dennis, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that or should we move on to another question? That was really, really incredible. Well, it's hard. It's hard to top that. I think. Mm. I think. Uh, so I won't even try. I think uh, Bruce provided an excellent closure, and I like your metaphor. Terence did keep the pilot light going. He lit the pilot light. The pilot light's been burning, and now maybe it's time to turn up the heat, but not in a global sense. But. <laughs> But yes, well, I mean, that's always been his role in some ways. He's been, I mean, in, at the height of his career in the, in the 80s and 90s, it wasn't cool to go into public and talk about psychedelics. You know, I mean, for most people, that was appalling. I mean, of course, for the people he talked to, they they loved it. But you have to hand it to him that he in an era when the very idea of touting the, the benefits of, of drugs was, uh, you know, not politically correct, he kept the conversation open. And now look where we are. You know, Terence uh, remarked to me, I, actually, I think he made a remark in public about the relationship to the mushrooms and bringing the mushrooms, you know, into society, which we had something to do. He said, we're involved in a symbiotic relationship with something, with something that's disguised itself as an alien invasion, so as not to alarm us, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and basically, here we are. You know, I mean, the the mushrooms did invade our society through the the basements of every you know tenth grade nerd that wanted to work on a project, a science fair project, perfect for that. And uh, and that's the way it that's the way it affected the revolution. Not a shot was fired, you know. And and now it exists, and now we're in an era where, you know, people are beginning to notice the the potential of mushrooms, and of course the the not just the the medical potential, but the economic potential. And we'll see how that plays out. The point is that he kept the conversation alive you know, during what was effectively the dark ages. So good for him. Wonderful, thank you so much. That actually kind of segued into the next question, um, which was towards both of you, as far as what do you feel that Terence's greatest contributions uh, were and what his greatest ideas were? And, and you, Bruce, thank you so much. That was really beautiful. We've got about five minutes left um, on the question and answer section. So Dennis, I was wondering if you have any final thoughts with that question in the forefront of your thoughts on Terence's greatest contributions and his ideas. Well, I think, yeah, he had, I think that in some way his greatest contribution was he gave people permission to play with their imagination, you know, and, and he gave people permission to think outside the box because he did it so well and he was so good at conveying that to people. And I think, uh, you know, his, a lot of his specific uh, contributions, they're interesting, the, the time wave and, you know, it was very interesting, the, the bringing the mushrooms into society is certainly something that, you know, I would say that was a collaboration between the two of us. So if you want to put your marker down and say, what are the most significant things, you could look at that. But I think the most significant thing is that Terence enjoyed playing with ideas, you know, and he gave other people permission to play with ideas. 
you know, and I think he re reached a certain point in his life toward the end of the 80s, early 90s, where he was having some doubts about some of the uh, some of the ideas that he'd kind of hitched his wagon to, if it was. But he was he was having he was, a, he, you know, I think people misunderstand that he took these ideas totally seriously. I don't think he did. I think they were idea complexes that he'd liked, he liked to play with. He didn't necessarily say this is true. He's just saying maybe it's true or wouldn't it be fun if it were true? The, I think his playful attitude toward manipulating these concepts and just throwing it out there, not that you're saying this is absolute revealed truth, but rather, here's an interesting idea. What do you think? And then inviting feedback. So he gave permission to people to do that, to learn how to use their imaginations. Could, and, I, could I add a little bit to that too? Of course. We've got about three, four minutes left, but yes, please, Bruce. <laughs> so, so for me, when I, when I hear him start a rap, you know, you just, you sit back and this man, however he did it, he would take you into a space. He would take you into a new world mm -hmm. and then he would cycle back magically. He would come back to the original thing and then he would, he would trip it more and he would cycle it more and cycle it more and cycle it more. He was an absolute master. An absolute master. I mean, having studied James Joyce and all these absolute masters, uh, for me, it's just the high art of his skill and whatever material it was, just as Dennis is saying, he could be reading from the telephone book. And for me, he was my mentor in not only the high quality of the, the telling and the threading of the story and the circling back, but of his, his absolute gentlemanly consideration and care for his listeners, for his audience, his politeness, his mm -hmm. patience for questions. And the fact that he, he took every question as though it was the most important question. He never dismissed anyone. He was such a beautiful gentleman in this world. And he's an example for, for us talking heads of how to do it really right. Yes, exactly, exactly. He never, and I, I guess it comes from experience because he was quite comfortable putting out you know, the craziest notions, right? And yet he did it with such skill that people who were normally skeptical could hear that and say, hmm, well, maybe there's something to that, you know, maybe mushrooms are from the stars, Let, you know, which would normally be something, I mean, that would be as difficult to defend as, you know, the flat earth hypothesis, which right. is, you know, and yet he could make it sound plausible uh, and, and partly it, it was, you know, it was because of the way that he presented it, you know, just the way he said it, because clearly he was, he's not crazy. He's not a raving lunatic. He talks in a very calm, focused manner. And then when you get to the next level and focus on what he's saying, he's, you're like, what? What is he saying? <laughs> you know, and, and so, uh, so it's interesting. I mean, he's sometimes called the bard. You know the bard of psychedelics, and uh, I mean, uh, and I guess he could make a legitimate claim to that. But in some way, he's also the trickster. You know, he's the person that makes you doubt what you think you know, that challenges your your assumptions, and mm. and that was a skill that he had. Wonderful. Thank you.